Ladies and gentlemen, hi, this is Dr. Tiffany M. Lloyd, host of Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff, broadcasting live each week on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time from Fishbowl Radio Network Studios at Globe Life Park in Arlington, Texas. Tune in to hear how we will be unpacking issues in our society, aligning with the teachings of Christ. So be sure to log on each week on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time to catch Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff. Follow me on Facebook at Dr. Tiffany M. Lloyd. Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff. I have with me Reverend Aaron Dobines from the Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site in Spotsylvania, Virginia. How are you, Reverend Dobines? Doing fantastic, Dr. Tiff. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for being on the show. And we're just going to cut right to it because we have a lot to dive into. So what does Jesus and justice mean to you? Well, for me, they're both synonymous. Justice is one of the strong themes that you see throughout the Old Testament. And Jesus was a Jew and um, he felt it necessary that especially those who had been previously locked out and considered to be uh, persona non gratis, such as women and the poor, he had a special place in his heart for them. And over and over again, you see Jesus standing with people uh, who had been ostracized and kicked to the curb of life, if you will. Uh, whether it's a woman who was caught in adultery or with the poor people that he healed, uh, the people who, uh, in the parable that he tells about the so-called Good Samaritan parable, you find that Jesus is saying that God speaks all languages and that there are no particular people who have a lock on the brand of who God is. We're all accessible to God, and God is accessible to all of us because we are all God's children. Right, right. So I read something that said that um, you indicated that Harriet Tubman was your shero. Why is yeah. Harriet Tubman your shero? She's my shero because she embodies what we just mentioned. Uh, she understood that to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, I'm sure all of our African enslaved uh, ancestors and other persons previous to that and even persons now who are um, locked up against their will for no reason because of the colors of their skin because of the side of the boundaries they live on all people all people want to be free and so harry tubman understood that she wanted to be free but she took it another step she was not satisfied with her just getting freedom for herself and she made a number of trips i think about 19 trips she freed anywhere from 250 to 300 people uh, from slavery, and that's not including the persons that she helped um, uh, in her military campaign to help um, bring black soldiers to the war and help to win the war and being a general, really, uh, in, in the Civil War for the Union soldiers, for the Union side. And so she, she really helps us, to, helps me to understand, and really will help us if we embody uh, her mindset that when God blesses us, he blesses us to be a blessing to others. Everybody does not have the same gift, but when God gives a person's a leadership ability or whatever it might be, none of that is entirely for that individual. It's always to be shared. And she's, she's probably the best example in the, of that, in my opinion, or one of them is, at least. Right, right. So we have a lot that's going on in our country. We hear, we're seeing, um, we saw COVID take over our lives last year, and then we saw the numbers going down, and people thought that, you know, we were going back to things, uh, business as usual, and, and we see the world not opening back up. We saw many states, such as Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, that open, but now we're starting to see another influx, another rise in COVID cases. And there are some people, still a lot of people who say, I don't believe in the vaccine. I don't believe in wearing masks. What do you say to those individuals that say wearing masks and getting vaccinated is showing that you don't truly trust God, is showing your lack of faith? 
I'm saying that's a bunch of baloney. That's what I'm saying about that. <laughs> I'm saying that uh, most of us go to the doctor for any number of illnesses. Doctors have been trained in their specialties. Doctors are not perfect, uh, but they've increased uh, the quality of life and length of life. Uh, when you go back a few years uh, earlier, a person who's my age uh, would have been considered a, to be an old person, and I'm not old. <laughs> but because of the advances in medicine, because of the advances in science, see, God is not anti-science. The being that created this universe brought all of this forward for us to embrace and make a better quality of life. Those people who are talking about uh, they're not uh, supportive of science, what do they think about the air condition that's running their house and the computer that they're using and the car that they're driving and all of these things that are vastly different from their grandparents? It's because of the advancements in science. Is science a perfect science? No, but it's, it's, um, it's better than what we've had. And certainly uh, I believe that uh, we are living longer lives and have a greater quality of life because of the advancements of, in science. God and science are not diametrically opposed. They are one and the same. Um, there are people who have underlying conditions who still refuse to wear masks, who still refuse to, um, you know, get vaccinated. And I tell people, you know, Ultimately, it is your decision if you want to wear a mask, if you want to uh, get vaccinated or not. But the mask that I wear, I'm not masking my salvation. I'm just masking my face. And so I think that sometimes people can try to be so spiritually deep and it doesn't make sense. To me, it's like you're going to your job and they don't pay you money. And then somebody comes up to you and say, but where's your faith? God is going to take care of your needs. And so if we're seeing the numbers and we're seeing, you know, uh, people like Doc Dr. Fauci that is telling us that it is important to get vaccinated. It is important to wear a mask. You know, it's, it's no judgment from me, but I just think it just ultimately makes sense for me to get vaccinated. And, you know, I was, I, I did a, post the other day and I was talking about how it, it, it aligns with the scripture, um, love thy neighbor, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. And so if I don't want anyone to get me sick, then I should have the same mindset that I don't want to get anyone else sick. And so that's, you know, my take on that. Do you think that it's too soon to open back up? I think just as you mentioned earlier, we should uh, pay close attention to the variants and the increase in the number of cases that we are, that are on the rise, as you say, in all 50 states. And, and certainly in the deep south, in my home state of Alabama, in my adopted state of Louisiana, and all around, you see the numbers going up. And that's not by accident, because these places are most often run by Republican governors who have made a decision to make the mask some kind of uh, flag for freedom or whatever their decisions are, but they go into stores every day that have a sign visibly posted that says no shoes, no shirt, no service. They wear seat belts uh, when they drive their vehicles because they know if a cop stops them, they are driving without a seat belt, they can go to jail. It's not because they uh, are going to have a wreck, but because they could have a wreck and be out of control and then, therefore, with the scripture that you said earlier about being concerned about your neighbor, um, that's the driving force. And that's one of the messages that Jesus hammered uh, from his time of uh, entry until his time of going back to his, his, his father's throne, sitting at the right hand, is that we ought to be concerned about our neighbor. One of my favorite stories is the so-called Good Samaritan story. And I call it that because... To say the Good Samaritan is almost to say that, that was an exception. That's like saying the Good Negro. So the Samaritan that Jesus raises up in, in the company of a fellow Jew who asks the question, who's my neighbor? And then tells him the story and then ask him at the end of the story, who, who was the neighbor? And, and, and he didn't even say the Samaritan. He said uh, the one who showed mercy uh, because perhaps he didn't, he still had a, well, he still had his prejudices. They don't go. To, they don't go away, and we'll get into that a lot later with some of the other questions regarding uh, white 
evangelism and, and black the black church. But yeah, I mean, Jesus said we ought to be concerned about our neighbor as we are concerned about ourselves. It's very selfish to not wear a mask. It's very selfish to not be vaccinated with all of the evidence that shows that it's, it's better for us. These same people go to the doctor for a stomach ache. Mm -hmm. But, right. And it was it was their president, if you will, who, you know, one of the best things that Trump did was have Operation Warp Speed so that the vaccines can't roll out in a very efficient and fast uh, way. Mm -hmm. And they work. They work. Mm -hmm. So. But, um, you know, if I'm not mistaken, President Trump was vaccinated as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, so um, I was a little, I'm, I, I'm a little shocked at some people's stance because, you know, I really thought that, you know, seeing President Trump get vaccinated, that some people would have um, look, taken that as a sign that they should also get vaccinated. And with President Trump also, um, unfortunately, getting COVID and his wife and his son uh, getting COVID. Now, speaking of the presidency, if you let's let's fast forward now to 2021, and we now have uh, President Joseph Biden in as the president. If you had to give President Biden a grade, what would that grade be and why? I would give him a B because he inherited uh, D minus. And he's raised that up to a B. And I think there's room for improvement. But again, remember what, we've been, what we suffered in the four years of uh, Trump's leadership, if that's what you want to call it. It was very divisive, very uh, childlike and, and childish in his comments um, towards people. And so we don't have to turn the television on and cringe. Uh, Joe Biden is Joe Biden. He's a career politician. And politicians like to be reelected, but I think he does have some plans, especially as it relates to infrastructure. I mean, I live 50 miles from our nation's capital. My wife and I were there dropping off our daughter uh, just last week or so. And going into the city, leading up to the 4th of July, it was awful. It was awful because it was dirty. The city was crowded because people uh, come to the nation's capital, especially in large numbers on the 4th of July. And they were there, they were already there, but there were places, it didn't look like our nation's capital should have looked. Um, contrast that to going to Toronto, Canada's largest city of, of over 2 million people. Uh, and, and it was super uh, noticeably clean. And so we could find ways of, of doing that uh, here and making sure at least our landmarks are, are kept uh, in a way that we would feel proud as Americans to, to see them there, but it, it was, it was atrocious, in my opinion. So I, I would give uh, President Biden a B, but only because he inherited a D minus and there's room for improvement. And we do know also that we, we got stonewalling from the Republicans, uh, people who helped to storm the Capitol or made endorsements for their storming of the Capitol on January 6th. Also, are, are, are you know, making uh, hay, trying to make political hay out of uh, the, the commission that will look into this. Here's the most serious incident like, that has ta attacked our nation within since the Civil War. And these people want to uh, sweep it under the rug and make it appear as though we didn't see what we know we saw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is your take on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act still facing opposition? Okay, let me start with the George Floyd uh, Policing Act. I think it's a good first step. I think the sentencing of uh, George Floyd's murderer uh, was a good first step because uh, qualified immunity that many police officers uh, have, which means that they don't have any accountability for their actions. And in the black community, we know what policemen, uh, we know their history, how they came into being there. They started out as the patrollers to uh, make sure that the enslaved stayed enslaved. They were often poor whites who were given a badge. They couldn't say anything to white people who were the, the bourgeoisie and the established whites, the slave owners. So it's a kind of a pick on the person who's beneath you mindset. And so that those are the persons who became cops. 
For instance, when I was a kid living in Marion, Alabama, there was a cop who had previously been uh, the garbage collector. He could not read or write, and a lot of the black people knew that. And so when he would give them tickets, they would sign his name, they would sign, you know, fictional uh, cartoon character's name, Bugs Bunny, whatever, because he couldn't read. But he was, he had a gun. The law was in his hands. And that motto uh, has never fully dissipated. Even with the addition of cops that look like us, you don't remove the systemic and long history of, of uh, being anti uh, anything, supporting the bourgeoisie and those in charge and being against those who are considered to be less than. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we have more black men incarcerated than we have in college? Is it because white men are so, so wonderful and nice? No, it's because of the racism that is built into the fabric of America. And part of that fabric is how we do policing even to this day. It's a good first step, but that's, and we were all celebrating when uh, the verdict came across that uh, the murderer was indeed found guilty, but there's still a whole lot of work to do because on January 6th, there were, there were active duty military persons there and active duty cops participating in a riot um, that uh, we all saw with our own eyes. Going back, going to John Lewis, that's near and dear to my heart. I used to pastor the historic Tabernacle Baptist Church in Selma, Alabama. It was the home of the founding of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And John Lewis was a major player in that. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a shame of what we see happening every day in Republican-led uh, states where there's an attempt to minimize the voting of black and brown people. Take, for instance, the work that Stacey Abrams did in Atlanta and in Georgia, rather. They had a Pat, Pat the Pew um, project, which meant that on Sundays, you could, after going to church, they would take people in a van and get them registered to vote. Now, a lot of people don't have the, uh, the uh, luxuries that you and I have with a flexible schedule, uh, Dr. Lloyd. So it's important that some of these people, when they're off on whatever day that is, say it's Sunday, they need to be able to conduct a lot of business on Sunday. If you can go to Walmart on Sunday and you should be able to do that, you should also be able to get your voter registration straight as well. But they're knocking that. It didn't say only black people could register people to vote on Sunday. That would be discriminatory. But it said anybody could go. And it was a special opportunity for people who uh, perhaps because of jobs and other commitments could not get to the uh, registration places uh, during the so-called normal hours. Wow. So speaking of the Black church, what is the state of the Black church? There are many churches that are still not open. There are still many churches, uh, many churches that did not survive during the pandemic. Many churches had to shut their doors forever. So what is the state of the Black church? Well, it is a, a time of reckoning. It's, it's, it's a time of evaluation. It's a time for us to look at the way we've done business and say that we can't do business like that anymore. It really made us and is making us have church beyond the doors, beyond the building. And it's helping us to embrace technology so that now, um, as I talk to most pastors that I know across the country, we are speaking to more people than we ever spoken to before. We're speaking to people in foreign countries. Um, we may have, uh, 60, 70 people, 100 people in the building. But now uh, there are uh, another 900 to 1,000 more people that all of us are reaching. And I think uh, it's, it's one of the um, gems, if you will, of a bad situation. So it, hopefully it will make us get outside of the building and think of ministry uh, as, yes, collective, but it, you know, as I would often say uh, when we were at in the church in the regular before the pandemic, we enter to worship, but we depart to serve. And that's that should be uh, not just a motto on the wall, it should be what we really guide ourselves in doing. That as I, I go to I go to church, it's a pep rap, but I go out of the church to play the game. I go to church to be inspired myself, but I leave the church hopefully uh, to be an inspiration to the people in my home, 
the people in my neighborhood, people on my job, and other places. I'm taking the church with me, but I think it is helping us, whether we know it or not, to evaluate and see that there are some practices uh, that we perhaps need to tweak, and some perhaps we need to just cut out, and new things we need to do, such as embracing technology, uh, is one of those things. And learning the language of technology, not being afraid of technology. Mm, okay. So we saw a lot of dissension between white evangelicals and African Americans, pastors, preachers. And it seemed, I, I witnessing people who I knew that did ministry work together um, years ago and before um, President Trump was president. Um, you know, and I was saddened to see how politics um, interrupted or ended friendships or caused a strain on friendships. And I've seen more pastors have really expressed their, you know, political opinions. And, and, and that's the beauty of America is that we have a right to be Republicans, Democrats, independent, or not be anything at all. We have a right to believe. We have a right not to believe. We have a right to vote. And, you know, we have a right not to vote, although we should vote. And I encourage everyone to vote. But we saw such dissension between white evangelicals, I'm not going to say every white evangelical, and African-American pastors and preachers. And I won't say every, but I will say a lot. What do you think caused that and what's, what's going to be the remedy for reconciliation? Well, what caused it is a theology that the white evangelical church never has given up on, and that is um, a theology of racism and division. Um, when you look at the founding of the, of the um, Southern Baptist Convention, because that was just the Baptist Convention, it was the formerly... Uh, the Northern Baptist, which is American Baptist now, and you had the um, um, you had the, uh, the, 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 the the Southern Baptist um, who, who, who split on the line of race. That theology that supported slavery and racism still persists today, and not only with Southern Baptists or um, in any particular group, but along uh, the lines of race. There are people who feel like they did us a favor, Dr. Tiff, by enslaving us and bringing us to America. That there, there are those who honestly believe that we were docile little children and they forget about the fact that we were building pyramids when they were in caves. But the, the, when you, the problem is you take the words of Jesus to twist them to your own theological liking. And that's something we have to try to resist. But when you look at the words of Jesus and the example of Jesus, how can you be a racist? How can you be anti-feminist? How can you be um, a person who builds walls rather than a person who tears walls down when you look at the life of Jesus? But what you have is a history, particularly with the Southern Baptists and, and, and evangelicals, who in 19, when, 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 Little Rock Central was, um, uh, um, you could say it was um, when black students entered, of course, they stopped going. But when black students entered uh, there in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, white people left. When Ruby Bridges came to your state of Louisiana, and when she enrolled in school, the white teachers stayed there, but the white students didn't go. So she had a whole school by herself because they have it ingrained in their theology. They get it, excuse my expression, from that mammy's milk, that you are better than people who, who are people of color. And here they have the audacity to write, and I was looking at this most recently, um, in their, their, their um, definitions of who they are and what they stand for. They said that black people and white people were like plants and animals, and plants and animals don't mix. But I got pictures... <laughs> of my great-grandmothers and great-grandparents who are light, bright, damn near white, right? How did it happen? Because some white rapist uh, um, uh, forced himself either by physical force or by custom onto 
my my ancestors. And so when we go to our family reunion, we have from chalk to charcoal. How did that happen? Let me give you a good story, hopefully, that brings it home. home. A couple of years ago at Centenary College, I was on a program with the first Black student to go to LSU, right? And now they have a Black chancellor. Look at how things turn. But he was saying to me that uh, when he had his granddaddy's funeral, um, his some the service started and two white women came in and before the service ended, they left. And he asked his daddy, Dad, who are those white women that came into the service? The granddaddy just rudely left out. He said, those weren't white women. Those were my sisters who had moved to Ohio and were passing as white, right? So, but my point is, it wasn't a black man with a white woman for the most part. It was white men forcing themselves, raping black women, and the chalk, the chalk code is what you get from those rapes, right? So the so if plants and animals don't mix, it wasn't that the issue. <laughs> the issue was we don't want white women with black men. Mm. That's we, that was the issue. Call it what it is, and and, and stop beating around the bush. Because if you're against plants and animals, these are their words coming together. Then why were you in the slave cabin raping my grandma? My great grandma. But there are some people who, okay, right? There, there's, there, I'm sorry. There, there are some people who don't feel that they are racist at all. Some people have this mindset: I don't see color. Some of my best friends are uh, people of color. My godchildren are people of color. My grandchildren are children of color. What do you say to those people who? some of these white evangelicals that have expressed their support for Trump and they have a lot of African Americans and people of color in their congregation. Yeah. And what do you say to them who, who, who are strong uh, Trump supporters, but they, but they're not racist. What do you, what do you say to that? I can say that I'm not whatever, and that not be the truth. I just may be blind to my truth. And we have blind spots. All of us have them. And I resent that statement. I don't see color. God made me this color. God encased me in this beautiful uh, melanin uh, skin. And so I want you to see it. You do see it. So don't act like you don't see it. Because you see it when I come in the room. You see it when you see my resume. You see it when I open my mouth and you're like, oh, my. You know, he has a command of the English language or something. Well, uh, that's not new. I, I know more people, uh, you know, I, I'm a big guy. I'm 6'4". I, I was a college athlete at one point for a small portion of my life. <laughs> I, I was a walk-on basketball player at the University of Alabama. But this is the point. So every time I go places, because I'm a big guy, people come up to me, and I remember distinctively being in, in Nashville, Tennessee, and somebody walked up to me, a white person, and said, oh, you you must have played ball. And I said, and it was a lie, but I said, no, I'm a concert violinist. <laughs> because, you know, if I was a big white guy, I don't doubt they, I doubt they would have said that right away. But because I'm a big black man and proud of it, I have to be an athlete. I was, but don't pigeonhole me to just that, because yes, I, I was an athlete, but I'm also this and that and other things. And so I think it's, um, it, it, every time I hear that, Dr. Tish, it, it, I cringe because you you say you don't see me. That's I'm the elephant in the room. How can you not see me? And my first name is often not Aaron. It's that black man or the black preacher or the black professor or what have you. So uh, that, come on now, that's foolishness. But more of a problem though, is why are these black people still in these churches? <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, forget uh, uh, these persons, because they're gonna, you know, and I, I told you, I've, I've stayed, I lived in Shreveport and passed in Shreveport for 13 years. So there are some churches that I could name by name, I won't that have these Republican back pastors uh, who are Trump supporters, they'll say that Trump supporters own the issue of abortion. 
but you know, and I know I'm kind of moving around, but abortion in the womb, what about abortion outside the womb? What about policies that abort me as a black man and you as a black woman, time we hit the hit planet earth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, very powerful. Um, what is your take on, there's one word that I think it fears a lot of people and that's mental health. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think that the church is so, churches, not all churches, because I do know some churches personally that address it, but there are a lot of churches who really don't want to address mental health. We've actually had pastors on here. Um, one pastor that comes to mind is Dr. Dennis Jones, originally from Shreveport, but pastors in Houston. He came out on this show and talked about that he struggles with mental illness and that that was his truth, that he wasn't hiding it anymore. And many people after he came on the show were shocked, but so many people wrote in and many people felt like well, he, he, you know, uh, Dr. Dennis Jones, being a well-known pastor, respected pastor, he came out and told his truth that he suffers from mental illness. Now, I'm not afraid now to speak my truth. Why do you think that the African-American community struggles with mental health? And what can the church's role be in, to help remedy this? Well, first, kudos to Dr. Jones. I, I know him personally. Um, and I didn't know that was part of his story, but uh, I'm proud of him for saying that because uh, it, it is, as, as you just mentioned, it helped other people to own that part of it. It's like, I'm diabetic. I'm a diabetic. I, I, I come from a long line of diabetics on my dad's side. People who had amputations and all of this sort of stuff, lives cut short, a quality of life cut short that was passed on to me genetically. Mental illness can come on in the same way, and certainly it can come on um, uh, you know, through the trauma that people have to endure, and people deal with uh, those kinds of tr uh, trauma issues in different ways. Ladies and gentlemen, hi, and welcome to Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff. I am your host, Dr. Tiffany M. Lloyd. This is the day that the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, magnify and praise his name. That was Reverend Dobines. Thank you so much, Reverend Dobines, for coming on Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff. We had a little bit more in the interview, and if you want to catch the entire interview, um, please, after my show, you can catch it on my Facebook page at Dr. Tiffany M. Lloyd, or you can catch the replay on YouTube at Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tip. If you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do so at this time and subscribe to Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tip. That was an amazing interview and we're going to be having Reverend Dobines back because he has a lot more that he wants to share and so I am excited to have him on. Um, please, if you, hello to all of my listeners that are listening to me on the Fishbowl Radio Network from around the world. Thank you so much for making Jesus and Justice this with, no, uh, with Dr. Tiff number two so hopefully prayerfully we can get to number one um, so and I want to say hello to all of my Facebook live viewers out there hello to you um, and please if you are watching me on Facebook live please type in where you are watching me from and please do a form of ministry please like and share 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 and hello to all of you that will be catching the replay on my YouTube channel on Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff um, we talked about trauma and um, I want to just say this that um, I have something to say and if you are watching me on Facebook live I'm asking you to share this on your page because this is an important message this entire week I spent an entire week uh, something that I have not done in over 20 years and I spent the entire week with my mom in Faraday Louisiana and I wasn't feeling well and it was just a lot you know so many deaths and so many people um, and my family um, that have transitioned over the past week, that have um, have COVID-19, that is sick, people fighting for their lives, and it was just a lot going on. And I don't know why the Holy Spirit was tugging at me, telling me that I needed to stay 
uh, for a little while at my mom's house. And for the first time in such a long time, I had a heart to heart with my mom. And we were just talking about different things, different scenarios, you know, you know, different, you know, situations with people. And something hit me on Sunday as me and my mom was talking. And I want to share this with you. That the reason why we find ourselves in life struggling in relationships and having inner struggles is because, because of the fact that it could be we never healed our inner child. I'll say that again. The reason why a lot of us struggle in any type of relationships, whether it's romantic, business, friendship, dealing with family members, dealing with people in pe period, and having inner struggles is because we never dealed with our inner child. What do I mean by that? All of us have experienced trauma. It could be childhood trauma. It could be the storms of life trauma. And childhood trauma doesn't mean that your parents abused you, your parents wasn't there, that someone molested you, raped you, you were abandoned. Abu childhood trauma could be you were bullied at school. Childhood trauma could be you, you, you struggle with the color of your skin. Childhood trauma could be that you lived in poverty and, and that you didn't have certain things. Childhood trauma could be that your parents were there, they were present, but they really didn't give you the love and affection that you were longing for that or just that's just a, a slither of the remnant of childhood trauma and then you have trauma we some of us have been through divorce some of us have been abused some of us have been molested some of us have been raped some of us have been verbally abused some of us have had people to do us wrong that we loved the the, the most some of us have had church hurt all of those things are trauma and if we really sit back and step back and look at this, if we're really honest with ourselves, we must say that I have endured some type of trauma, whether it was adult trauma or whether it was childhood trauma. If you find yourself always apologizing, you're always in mess, or you're always going from relationship to relationship, you're sleeping with different people, if you always find yourself being intimidated, being insecure, having low self-esteem, if you always find yourself not letting anyone get close to you, if you always find yourself always being defensive and argumentative and being manipulative and scheming and being deceptive and being jealous and you always have it out for people, if you always find people that are falsely accusing people, if you always find people they just don't have nothing positive to say, if you are that person where you don't think that nothing good should happen to you and when something good happens to you, then you think, okay, what's the catch? It's too good to be true because I don't trust people. If you find yourself where the minute that trust comes you run and you say oh everybody else is the same way if you find yourself being so defensive and being so protective that the minute that someone says something to you you just lash out that all could be of what I just named and a cornucopia of other things it could be it stems from trauma think about it think about though those people who long for love who they cannot be by themselves it could be we never know they could have faced abandonment in their life Life. could be it could be the fact that you don't know how to deal with conflict is because that's what you were taught it could be the fact that you're always apologizing maybe because if we're really honest when you look back on your childhood you was always fussed at if you made any type of mistake come on somebody am I making sense it could be the reason why you don't trust people in relationships and you think that everybody is lying everybody is cheating on you you always thinking that it's another man or another woman is maybe because that's what has always happened to you so you think that everybody else is like this and sometimes you run a person away because of your toxicity and because of your insecurity why is it that sometimes you may always feel that you're so combative and you got to have the last word and you got to go tit for tat and you got to spend, send these four page uh these four page text messages or emails it could be that no one really heard your voice it could be that you are so 
clinging on to this relationship when you know it's not healthy because maybe if you really think about it your childhood may remind you that you dealt with some type of trauma am I talking to somebody today if you're not careful you will never have successful romantic relationships you will never have any type of successful relationship if you don't heal your inner child if you don't deal with your trauma when I was talking to my mom I realized that I had some inner I'm being very transparent I realized that I had some trauma that I hadn't dealt with when me and her was talking and it wasn't necessarily directed at my mom I realized I had you know what I had to do I had to go to the cemetery and I had to have a conversation with some people that I was still holding that I thought that I was over and the reason why I find myself not being successful in certain parts and having these struggles in certain parts was because I didn't heal my inner child because of the fact that because I am older oh that happened in childhood listen let me tell you something some of you right now 40 50 60 70 80 90 years old and you are the way that you are because you have not healed your inner child you haven't forgiven your mama your daddy your sisters your brothers people treating you like the black sheep of the family so now you are walking around saying oh whoa it's me come on am I talking to somebody you may have had an uncle or somebody to molest you that you never talked about with anybody you got to heal your inner child the reason why why you can't you treat women bad the reason why you treat men bad the reason why you talk down to people is because that maybe just maybe that happened to you as a child maybe you were in a marriage that was like that so therefore some because someone did you like that you want to pay back get paid back and do someone else like that you have to go and heal your inner child healing your inner child is not an overnight process healing your inner child first of all is recognizing that you got some trauma and if we're really honest all of us no matter how saved sanctified filled with the holy ghost we are how, how smart how much credentials we have we all got some trauma in our life if you want to be honest we all out here struggling i don't know who told you that you you don't have no struggles because you or you made it in life and you got certain titles you drive certain cars you live in certain neighborhoods you got a certain zip code but if we're really honest all of us have some trauma in our life and your big you want to know what your in who your inner child's hero is your ch inner child's hero is you when you're able to look in the mirror and say I broke the generational curse that was on my family hallelujah that I broke the chains that was having me bound to where I can have a successful relationship that I am worthy to be loved that I'm not worried about another man I'm not worried about another woman I'm not worried about nobody else because I am good all by myself and it doesn't matter who walks in and out of my life because someone walks in and out of my life or may choose someone else that is not a reflection of who I am now your inner ch your childhood trauma your trauma in life is not your fault but it does not give you a right to be toxic to other people it does not give you a right to be mean to people and to do tit for tat with, for, with people hurting people because they hurt you just because you have trauma it doesn't give you a right to go and bleed on other people now the choices that you make is all on you if you really want to change your ways you can change your ways and how do you do that nothing better than getting in the word of God and standing Standing on his promises and praying and asking God to take it off of you but you can't just ask God to take it off of you you got to do the work you got to press past your feelings you got to apologize to people uh, even if they don't accept your apology you have to apologize to people that you have done wrong and you can no longer allow your childhood trauma or your adult trauma to control you a lot of us are allowing our trauma to control our lives Am I talking to somebody? I had to realize I was lashing out on somebody. I was lashing out at this person. And I didn't even realize that I was why I was lashing out on the on the person. And I was saying things that I know that I didn't mean. And what that when I was having the conversation with my mom, I realized something hit me is that oftentimes we lash out and we say things to people not because we mean what we say, but it's because of the fact that it is reminding of our childhood. We're responding to our childhood. Now, sometimes people do say things out of anger that that's what you really want to say, uh, you know. 
you know, it's no excuse. What I was doing is no justification with my behavior. And I had to apologize and I had to be real and say, you know what? The reason why I was acting like this was because of trauma that I never dealt with. Some of you, you deal with trauma by sleeping with different people. Some of you, you deal with trauma by get by drinking yourself away, by just drinking alcohol and getting drunk and trying to forget about your problems. But no matter what you do to try to suppress that, the problem will still be there. You have to heal your inner child. And if there's someone out there that you owe an apology to, you got to ask for forgiveness. And listen, you can't get mad if they don't forgive you. You can't get mad if they don't even want to reconnect with you. That, that's just the nature of the beast. But what you do have to do is be free of it. Once you apologize, it is sincere apology. You've repented to God. You are doing the work to be a better person and they still refuse to forgive you or reconnect. That's not on you anymore because you have done what is required of you according to the word of God. Now, some people, it just takes a long time, you know, to, to heal. Some people, uh, they don't know how to get over certain things. And some of that could be, you don't know how to move past some things. This, these things keep controlling you over what somebody said to you or what somebody done to you. It could be because of trauma. It could be that the, uh, uh, that you had to grow up faster than what you were and you missed out on childhood. That's not your fault but you got to move past it. You don't have to remain there. You don't have to be like your mama, your daddy, your sisters, your brothers, your grandparents. You don't have to be how they were. You be who God called you to be. And I hope all of us heals our inner child. You know what I want you to do? This may sound crazy. Is that when you go home tonight or when this evening, look, find a picture of your younger self, of you when you was a baby or a toddler. And I want you to look at that picture, and I want you to talk to that picture, something that you wanted someone to say to you when you was a child. And I want you to hug the picture of your child, of, of, of you as a child. Because a lot of us, we didn't get that. The reason why I struggled in relationships, and I thought about this, is because I lost my dad at such a young age. I was 17 when I lost my dad. I was on the phone talking to my dad, and then 30 minutes later, he drops dead of a heart attack. And that haunted me for years because, wow, what would I have said if I would have known that that would have been the final conversation? And then he passed away suddenly when I was 17, the age where every girl needs their father. And I'm gonna be transparent and it's gonna bless somebody and set somebody free. The reason why I struggled in relationships of trusting is because those men who were in my life pretending to be that father figure, they had a hidden agenda. And as a child, that scorned me because here you are pretending to be this fatherly role in my life or church people, whomever, pastors, whomever, and that really wasn't your motive at all. And so I realized talking to my mother, the reason why I've had trust issues because that stemmed from my inner child. And so I hope that this has been a blessing to you and that you'll do the work and really have some self-reflection and ask God to reveal to you some things that you don't even realize. And that we will all heal our inner child. If this has been a blessing to you, please donate. Give a donation to Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff. We can't do this without sponsors and your support. Please go to the Fishbowl Radio Network. Click on uh, Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff and donate via PayPal. Or you can donate via Cash App at dollar sign Jesus and Justice. All one word. Dollar sign Jesus and Justice on the Cash App. Please follow me on Instagram at Tiffany.m.Lloyd. Please follow me on Facebook at Dr. Tiffany M. Lloyd, and please subscribe to my YouTube channel at Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff. We have an amazing show on next week. We have Reverend Chris Wesley, the pastor of the Antioch Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. He has a lot to say as he has taken on being the pastor of the Antioch uh, Baptist Church um, uh, after the untimely death of his father, Reverend Kerry Wesley, who was the founder of the Antioch Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. So until until then, heal your inner child. I love you from the bottom and top of my heart. May God bless you is my prayer.
Ladies and gentlemen, hi, this is Dr. Tiffany M. Lloyd, host of Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff, broadcasting live each week on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time from Fishbowl Radio Network Studios at Globe Life Park in Arlington, Texas. Tune in to hear how we will be unpacking issues in our society, aligning with the teachings of Christ. So be sure to log on each week on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time to catch Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff. Follow me on Facebook at Dr. Tiffany M. Lloyd. Jesus and Justice with Dr. Tiff. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in.